All right, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, tonight we're going to uh, have a presentation and discussion of Norris Clark's uh, The One and the Many, Chapter 15, The Metaphysics of Evolution. And uh, this is a very uh, intriguing and uh, rich topic. So uh, looking forward to uh, hearing the presentation uh, by uh, Jack, uh, can, how do you pronounce your last name? Bozar, Silent C. Jack Bozar, great. So uh, without any further ado, please. All right, so let's get right into it. Um, so we, it's a fairly short chapter, but there's a lot of content going on. So I figured what I would do is just go through a little bit of his outline. So he starts off by I think what's it's important to note that in the Catholic tradition, evolution is accepted. And so we have here a quote from John Paul II himself. This is top of page 246. That basically urges Catholics to investigate, accept evolution and investigate the theological implications of it. Now, what I would suggest is kind of bracketing this because in a lot of Protestant traditions, this is not gonna be accepted. But for now, my approach in my studies is just to assume its, um, assume its validity or soundness and kind of go from there. So with that in mind, Clark is going to propose, or he's going to talk right here on page 246 about some of the main problems posed by evolution. <clears throat> so right off the bat, I think it's important to distinguish kind of between the scientific problems and the metaphysical problems. Now, what I have in mind with regard to the scientific problems are, for instance, the origin of life, the Cambrian explosion, the arrangement of DNA nucleotide bases, protein folding sequences, et cetera, et cetera. If you want more information on that, you can look up the Discovery Institute if you've heard of them. They do a lot of work on this and the scholars there. <clears throat> but that's kind of not really our concern in this text. That's really for the natural sciences. The concern here is going to be a more ancient problem, and that's going to be the metaphysical problem of, I guess you could say substantial form or of the orig origin of organisms that have different powers. And so I'll, I'll kind of discuss what I mean by that because that's a really crude way of putting it. But right off the bat here, again, bottom of page 246, he's, he's making the same distinction and he's saying, look, here's the problem for the metaphysician. And if you go to page 247, he puts here down here, central metaphysical problem. And I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna read this briefly. Granted from science, the fact that in the course of evolution, more complex and higher beings have in fact emerged from simpler and lower beings. So right here, we're accepting the premise of evolution. We're accepting its soundness. And we are saying, how can this be? How is it metaphysically intelligible without violating the principle of proportionate causality or the PPC? which is no effect can be greater than its cause. Is this is intervention of some higher cause outside the previously given system needed? And if such is needed, what, what the hell is it? Where does it come from, et cetera? So we have to really unpack this paragraph because I think is, this is one of the central paragraphs. He's invoking what's known as the principle of proportionate causality, which Edward Fazer lays out in his classic metaphysics very nicely. And the PPC is actually derived from the principle of sufficient reason. <clears throat> and you know, I don't, I don't really want to go into this because that would take us too far afield. But the basic idea is <clears throat> how can, say, a rational animal like us <clears throat> emerge from a animal or a non-organic bunch of material? How can that be if those things, namely the organic material, the inorganic material, and the animality don't possess rationality? Um, it's, it, would seem that it would seem that this is a violation of the principle of proportionate causality because the effect of emergence of our rationality is seemingly greater than its cause, namely these organic particles or the animal nature. And so the way I like to visualize it is kind of like a ladder. 
where at the bottom you have inorganic material, inorganic compounds, then you have organic compounds, um, then you have like plant life, animal life, and finally you have rational life like us. And how, how do you make those jumps from or up the rungs of the ladder? Because it seems like that is going to, each jump is going to um, violate the principle of proportionate causality because there is no life in non-life. There is no rationality in purely organic material. There is no um, rationality in the animal kingdom, et cetera, et cetera. So he goes through here. This is the problem we're going to try to address. He goes through here um, and looks at some, some inadequate solutions, as he calls them, who have reductive materialism, emergentism, <coughs> and naturalism. And the basic idea with all of these, starting with reductive materialism, is that they don't give us an adequate answer to how we move up the rungs of the ladder. So I'm sure we'll talk about the critiques in a little bit more detail. But I think that um, emergentism is often thrown around a lot. I've heard this before. One of the problems with emergentism is that it simply is not descriptive enough. Um, it's almost like a hand wavy type notion. And the problem with material or reductive materialism is that, let's see where, where he says this right here. He says, it gives no adequate explanation or recognition of the basic fact presented by evolutionary history, namely that out of simpler unities, new, more complex ones emerge with properties that are nearly, ne neither merely the sum of already existing properties of the simpler unities, nor deducible directly from them, but are distinctly on a new level. The classic stock example that both Clark and Phaser use is gonna be water. <clears throat> and I actually got into a, a heated discussion with a non-philosopher who works at the Discovery Institute about this, because I said that water, i.e. H2O, is an example of a substantial form. And by that, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the term, by that I mean it's an example of something in nature that is irreducibly complex or, or, um, or is irreducible to its, to its chemical components. Namely that water exhibits features, i.e. being a universal solvent, freezing at 32 degrees, et cetera. It exhibits features or causal powers that its chemical components do not. And its chemical components, hydrogen and oxygen, also exhibit causal powers that water does not. So here we have an example of some sort of substance that cannot be reduced to its chemical components. And so Clark's point with this example seems to be that you cannot perform this reductive materialism without serious consequences. And we can generalize this to say that it doesn't seem like we can perform this reductionism to features of reality like intentionality, um, rationality, Etc. So those are just some of the basic problems and or basic problems with these hypotheses that I've spelled out. But let's take a look here at. Um, let me look briefly at 249 to see if there's anything I want to touch on. He touches on naturalism, which I think would be there's a, there's a lot packed in, um, and I'm not going to go really into it right now. Um, but he, but he def this is important. Uh, on the bottom of page 248, he defines naturalism as the doctrine that nature is self-sufficient, i.e. completely capable of producing all the results of evolutionary history from the lowest to the highest, including humans, by its own built-in resources or natural causes, without the intervention of any higher cause from outside the already given system, especially not an intelligent designer. This is very, very important to note. I would, I, I would take serious stock of this because um, in, in philosophy, I personally have heard a lot of people really struggle to define naturalism. And this is an extremely good definition here. What it is, it's, it's an articulation of something called the causal closure principle, which is a term that Lloyd Gerson at Toronto uses quite often. And the causal closure principle, is, it's pretty much what Clark says, but it's the idea that causation is closed into the natural world. There's, there's nothing outside of it that's acting, it's simply if you want to put it in Aristotelian Thomistic terms, it's simply efficient causation and material causation in kind of a bastardized sense, because for Thomas and Aristotle, those can't exist without formal and final causes, but you get the idea. 
So that's a good thing to note right there. Obviously, Clark's going to provide a brief critique of naturalism, which is similar to his critiques of emergentism and reductive materialism. <coughs> I did have a note, a side note from my, some of my own experiences here that I wanted to touch on, which is interesting. So on page 250, he has in the, in the second paragraph here, he mentions intelligent design theory. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but it is worth checking out. I actually um, did a program with the Discovery Institute who that, that's, that's the main people that he references, Michael Bay, hey, Stephen Meyer, et cetera. They're at the Discovery Institute. I actually did a program with them, um, not this last summer, but two summers ago. And intelligent design gets a lot of flack, not only from Thomists, but from materialists. And um, I think that a lot of that is undeserved. And I personally am not that big a fan of intelligent design theory. I think that it goes, um, I think there are some problems with it, but that's, that's another conversation. But I do think that it's really, really often misrepresented. The basic claims, and this is relevant because on basically 250 and 251 here, the top of 251, Clark is talking about intelligent design. I think the basic idea is that um, current contemporary Darwinian theory seems to have a lot of fundamental mathematical and biological type flaws. So there's a problem with the origin of life. Okay, and James Tour, T-O-U-R, is going to be at the DI, the Discovery Institute, pointing that out. There's a problem with the explanatory power of Darwinian theory in regards to the Cambrian explosion. So Stephen Meyer is going to write significantly on that. And then there are serious problems with the formation or the combination of the DNA nucleate, four nucleotide bases and the protein folds. And there was a famous colloquium back in the 70s at MIT where the central question was, how exactly can these protein folds or how probable is it, how likely is it that these protein folds would in fact form to create a protein which is necessary for life? And there seems to be, with, with, with current research, it seems to be very, very, very rare to get a functional protein fold, which would mean that it's very, very rare to get a functional protein, which would then mean it's very, very rare to get some sort of living organism. And so these can be developed into critiques of Darwinian theory. Now, where I, dis I, I don't disagree necessarily with any of those critiques, where I think that ID or intelligent design theory kind of falters <clears throat> is that it fails to take into account people like Jerry Fodor and Thomas Nagel, because those are two examples of people who, two examples, and Noam Chomsky. The, the, these three examples are, are naturalists. These three people are naturalists who in fact aren't worried seemingly by the Darwinian, the critiques of the Darwinian paradigm. And the reason why is that they seem to think that, okay, well, we can just have another naturalistic theory or a modified Darwinian theory or something else that can replace the, that, that, that can basically make up for the current problems that, that the intelligent design theorists are pointing out. And so because of that, I really don't like weighing in on this debate. And I prefer to, to go with the uh, stronger metaphysical arguments, which Clark is really doing. So the structure of this chapter, if you want the more abstract view, is Clark is kind of bracketing off the scientific issues and he's providing a metaphysical critique of evolution. And that metaphysical critique is based upon this principle of proportionate causality and he is in fact saying that because of our first principles, namely the PSR and the PPC, we cannot go from non-life to life. We cannot then go from life to animal life. And we cannot go from animal life to rational life because all of these jumps are instances where the effect is in fact greater than the cause, a clear violation of the PSR and the PPC. That is going to be the fundamental critique of evolutionary theory. <clears throat> and that is the one that I think is worth dwelling on. That, and and that, that's basically what this chapter is about. So with, with all that kind of going on in the background, on 251, he gives an 
he gives a, an example, or, or he really talks about his Thomistically inspired solution, he calls, and he breaks this down into three parts, A, B, C. So A, he labels evolution in the non-living universe. And if you go on here to 252, he says, <coughs> um, it's not, it, it doesn't seem like that big of a problem. He says here, it would seem that all that is strictly needed here for purposes of sufficient reason is the infusion of a range of active potentiality within the original simple elements present in the original cosmic soup ordered to combine with others as the external conditions permitted, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this would be a kind of latent active potentiality layered in depth. And he goes on and it, 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 in, in my brief uh, skimming of this right now, and of course my previous reading, it doesn't seem like he, he really considers this to be a big problem. And so I kind of don't really wanna dwell much on it. You can go and read it on your own or discuss it later. The real problem here is B and C. Okay, this is gonna be the meat of the chapter. So B, he labels the evolution of subhuman life on our planet and C, he labels the special case of the creation of the human soul. <clears throat> so what's going on here is that microevolution and again Darwinian theory do not seem to be able to account for and again this is on 254 do not seem to be able to account for the transitions from one species on one level to a significantly higher qualitative level so it doesn't it doesn't seem like we can jump up that ladder like i laid out again he says here on 254 the three crucial steps are as i mentioned previously the transition from non-living matter to the first living cells, the transition from non-cognitive vegetative life to cognitive animal life, and especially the transition from animal to intellectual human knowing and willing. In a word, the emergence of the higher from the lower, the qualitatively more from the less. This is the big problem. So he provides two potential solutions, and he's gonna say that the first solution actually doesn't work. <coughs> The first solution is quite complex and it, it, it's very interesting, but it's basically that there is, and this is on the top of 255, there's this deep potentiality latent in the universe. And this is really, really an interesting theory. I've never heard of this before outside of this, but basically the idea is that deep, deep within or, organism, organic or um, non-organic molecules basically there is this deep potentiality or this deep final cause for the end of rationality <coughs> now what's interesting about this is i think you could accept it and i think it would it would also seem to um necessitate aquinas's fifth way so it really wouldn't impact i don't think a lot of the theological implications um it would seem to me that no matter what, final causality necessitates the acceptance of Aquinas's fifth way, but that would be a debate for another time. And Clark, in fact, does actually reject this view on 255 by saying, but on careful reflection, it does not seem plausible that the active potentiality to produce something of a significantly higher qualitative level of being can actually reside in an ontologically lower being. So in other words, basically what he means is that it does not seem possible or likely that inorganic molecules will have a deep or hidden potentiality to in fact produce creatures like us. As Alice Dar McIntyre points out in, in one of his essays, it, it, it really doesn't seem likely that the inorganic or, or the, the, um, the organic molecules will produce James Joyce reading atheists, atheist physicists. <laughs> um, it, it, it just it, it, and even if it did, like we have to go, then go back to my point and say, okay, well, what's going on here? Does this final causality actually necessitate a theological implication, which in fact would be Aquinas's conclusion vis-a-vis -vis the fifth way? So, with that in mind, let's turn to his second solution here, and that's going to be on page two fifty six. The creation of the material world by God is an ongoing process. This is really interesting because. When I first was reading about Aquinas on creation, and I don't know very much about this topic, but I do know this, he thought of creation as an ongoing process, whereas I used to think of creation as just a one and done type thing. <laughs> Surprisingly, that's, that's, that's not in fact the case. But he says here down on near the bottom of 256, 
The key point in this metaphysical explanation is the notion of creation as a continually ongoing activity of God, creatively forming his own universe as it unfolds, infusing new active potentialities into it as needed at cr crucial transitional thresholds, thus collaborating, thus collab, thus collab, collaborating creatively with the whole process as it ascends slowly upward. So basically, God is infusing information into the ongoing process of creation. <coughs> this is really, really interesting. And this is going to be a second solution, which he, which he argues for. And then he goes and talks about this third case of the human soul. And um, we have to ask what the metaphysical, um, the, the, he says here on 257, then the metaphysical question arises of what can be the adequate adequate cause of the origin of the human soul. And his conclusion here on 258 is that the appearance in our world of a new human being is something very special. As Genesis alludes, the collaboration of heaven and earth, the earth rising up as far as it can, and the heaven reaching down, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The production of an embodied spirit that we call a human person with a corresponding destiny extending through but beyond this whole material world. Nothing less than the creative an creative initiative initiative of a transcendent cause can render adequate sufficient reason for the emergence at the end of the cosmic story of this amazing microcosm the human person that integrates within itself all the levels of creation from the lowest material to union with the highest spiritual the author of the whole story when i read this i was like holy fuck this is unbelievable because contained here is one of his greatest insights and one of the greatest insights i personally have taken from clark which is, and he's going to spell this out in the final chapter. <laughs> Not only does he provide here a solution to this problem um, that we've been wrestling with, which is, which is the metaphysical problem, but he provides here the genesis or the seed of the solution to the age-old question of why, in fact, did God create man in the first place? He's actually going, you can see here the genesis of that with this last sentence, and I'll, I'll read it again, or part of it again. Um, the emergence of at the end of this cosmic story of this amazing microcosm, i.e. us, the human person, that, and this is the crucial part, I think, that integrates within itself. So we integrate within ourselves all the levels of creation. So the organic, the inorganic, the rational, and the animal from the lowest material, like I said, to the union with the highest spiritual. And we also go beyond that because we as Athanasius of Alexandria would say participate in the divine nature through through theosis and so this this is unbelievably striking I mean you can meditate for years on this and and I want you to keep this section in mind when you read the final chapter because you'll start to see what I mean and how he kind of provides an answer to to why we were created <laughs> but this seems to be like the genesis of that um he's gonna have the conclusion here and this is actually also extremely important, and I wanted to point this out. He's going to conclude basically summing up what I just said, but he has a note here at the bottom and going on to the next page. And so I want to briefly mention this. He says that there's a growing resistance, not only scientists, but philosophers, to allow this resistance to allow any intervention of God or any higher cause in the evolutionary process. <coughs> and he says, there seem to be two very deeply flawed reasons why this is the case. One, there is a diminishing philosophical recognition of the irreducibly immaterial nature of the human soul as the source of the irreducibly immaterial activities of the intellect and the will. So what he means by that is that, and this is very common, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually a TA right now for ethics, which is a hundred person class. And, and, and I, so I interact with a lot of undergrads and they have no clue what the soul is. And they, a lot of them really seem to think that the brain and the mind are identical. And so this is an assumption that is very prevalent in today's culture, especially in regard to, and I'll be a TA actually next semester for cognitive science. So I'll be dealing with this question quite a bit, but th there's an assumption going on that's very prevalent in the culture that, <clears throat> The soul is kind of just this bullshit word that has religious connotation, and the mind is essentially identical with, with brain states. And what Clark's pointing out is that this assumption basically diminishes our ability to think about God interjecting into the cosmic process. 
And what I've been doing to kind of to combat this is pointing out one that the brain is not necessarily identical to the mind, basic arguments, you can do that very easy. And two, the soul doesn't have to have a religious connotation. In fact, the soul is simply the difference, whatever that may be, between a corpse and, and a live person. And if you just give the undergrads that basic insight, they're like, oh yeah, well, that makes sense. Like we don't have to interpret this through some religious framework that I may, may or may not accept. So the second principle here that's worth pointing out uh, on the bottom of 258 and top of 259 is the underlying principle rarely if ever submitted to full critical examination or justification that nature is an all encompassing self-contained whole of which humans are an inseparable part. <coughs> so this is basically the assumption of methodological naturalism. Um, it's the assumption that, well, nature just seems to be self-enclosed. Everything is here that we need. Ergo, we don't have to do this. There's a, an interesting interview that I had to watch as an undergrad with Ned Block, who I think is at MIT. He's a philosopher of mind. I think he's at MIT, but he might be elsewhere now. And he, in fact, said that his motivation for looking for a materialist theory of mind, namely a computational approach, is that if we don't have a materialist theory of mind, then the sciences can't investigate it and we would have to leave it up to the domain of religion, which is anathema, anathema. So that's his motivation. And, and that is a clear example of this methodological naturalist assumption, namely that <coughs> the mind, the intellect, rationality, whatever you wanna say, simply has to be reducible to the natural because the natural is self-enclosed. And Clark says, well, we, we, that's an assumption that you're making. It's a big one. We should probably investigate that. Um, so with that, I'll end. And uh, I hope that was informative. That's the, the, the basic summary. Obviously, there's a lot contained here, but enjoy. Yeah, thanks uh, very much, Jack. Uh, that was um, uh, very uh, informative and uh, well-structured uh, presentation. So thank you so much for, um, for joining us this evening. Um, before we shift into kind of general discussion, uh, does anybody have any questions, uh, clarifications they wanted to pose to Jack about any of the, the points he brought up? I wanted to add, okay. I wanted to ask Jack from your own um, observation, you working with undergrads who don't have a notion of the soul and re, uh, reading, I remember reading, um, you know, Jerry Fodor and Ned Block many, many years ago in my philosophy of mind classes too. And it seemed like there were two underlying motivations, like <laughs> even just psychological motivations that people had. And one would be a, just a commitment to materialism. And another would be, if I give an inch here, I'll end up back in religion. Yes, yes, yes. That, that I mean, so, so what's interesting is I'm at University of Georgia, um, and about 70% of my class are theists of some stripe, but not one of them is a justified theist. Um, and I've talked to the majority of them. So, but, but, so, so that's, that's interesting. Also, another interesting thing that it, that's kind of off topic is, and this is worth thinking about, um, almost none of the people in my class, even the theists, are familiar with the biblical stories at all. That's that's something that's that that I've been trying to. I don't know what to do with that. But but no, I would I would certainly say that 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 was the um, vibe, if you want to use that kind of cringy word. That was the vibe I got from my undergraduate professors, and it seems like from. <coughs> the undergrads that I talk to, though I'm trying to think of a concrete example, I would have to ask the question in a more direct way. Um, and I'm gonna keep this in mind next semester when I'm doing cognitive science, but yes, I think it almost follows logically that if you collapse back into a dualism, what happens? Well, you would have to have some sort of method for investigating the non-material, which you could do via, via metaphysics, but it would also open the door to immortality. It would also open the door to things like reincarnation. 
it would open the door to um <clears throat> It would say, you know, maybe it's not religion. That's the fear. Maybe it's the inability of the natural sciences to investigate the mind if materialism is rejected. I would say that would be the weaker thesis that I would agree with right now, but I, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to your stronger thesis. Yeah. Um, the, I remember back in my philosophy of mind classes, uh, which there were many of, <clears throat> the... Uh, the two favorite ones tended to be, and they were both um, compatible with materialism. One was um, Donald Davidson's anomalous monism, and mm -hmm. another was some some species of functionalism. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what made me recognize when you said that um, Ned Block didn't really care mm -hmm. about whether this particular theory were true, because if he were a functionalist, any material uh, substratum or or you know, it could be a brain in a vat or whatever. Yeah. Anything would function, would, if sufficiently <laughs> investigated, would would uh, produce explanations of what we think is non-material. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, that's spot on. I remember functionalism. What, what What's interesting, have you done anything with, um, excuse me, Thomas, Thomas Aquinas's philosophy of mind? <clears throat> no, that's where I'm a beginner. <laughs> yeah. Um, Edward Fazer is actually writing a book right now on it, which should be out next year at some point. So I'm excited for that. But um, <clears throat> I like Fazer. Yeah, he's he's I'll be interested to see. He's what good he's for doing. newcomers to this, too. <clears throat> and mm -hmm. he, he writes in a um, in a philosophically rigorous way that I, I recognize from the anal all the analytic philosophy. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, any more questions, comments? <laughs> and we can feel free to open out into kind of a whole group discussion, you know, as, as we like. So, um, so please. Uh... Yeah, The uh, I, I appreciated your uh, your excitement about how he kind of converged in this explanation for the reason of existence of us, you know, and the fact that we integrate everything that has already been created and we go beyond that and, and be able to be self-aware of that creation that that comes to into existence. Um, but the first argument that you brought out seemed like it was more of a uh, uh, kind of a Tillard argument. Uh, are you familiar with Tillard de Chine? His His idea of the omega point or anything like that. The fact that the universe is kind of groping us to actually come to become self-aware of itself. And, 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 as, and so there's a sense of like, not so much a bottom up, but a top down approach to evolution in the way he approaches it. Although he brings in a lot of spiritual jargon into into it and, you know although he was a scientist he was a paleontologist so i'm just wondering uh why did you find that side of it maybe less convincing than the other side of it i'm not sure yet i don't know i'm 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 um it's it it, it, it i don't i don't have an answer right now but i will look up who can you put in the chat what what that what that guy's name is <laughs> sure yeah no i'll look that up because i just i just don't know it's 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 one of those things where it's it's like it's a thought that's very interesting but i just don't know the metaphysics behind it enough to to kind of comment on it my 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 gut reaction right now is is to say that it seems to me that there there has to do it has to do something with our, our final end, so our final cause, but we then have to specify, okay, well, what is our final cause? And the way I've been trying to wrestle with it is kind of from that, the, the patristic notion of theosis, but I'm still just way too underdeveloped to kind of understand anything. So, yeah. 
And um, what what would be sort of the plus and the negative side about intelligent design in your view? Because you said you you think it's underrated, but at the same time you realize that there are problems with it. So I'm just curious to get your feedback on that. My my plus side is like I think it's very useful for poking holes in this bullshit Darwinian paradigm, frankly. Um, that's just so unbelievably prevalent in everybody's minds. I mean, it's like literally everybody I talk to is it, it, about biology and stuff and um, is operating under this Darwinian paradigm. And, and, and whether or not it's true, I hate the fact that it's such, it's a golden idol. It's a, it, it, it's a, it's a golden calf in our day and age. And it's like, okay, well, there are some fundamental flaws with it. Granted, they may not be flaws in the long run, but as a philosopher, like I hate the unjustified naivety about it. Um, and so for instance, I was sitting in on a class earlier this year and it was evident, <laughs> there was a philosophy of nature class and it was evident that all the undergrads simply could not understand the Timaeus, Plato's dialogue, and because they were operating with this Darwinian assumption um, I don't remember the details because it was back in August, but that was my initial thought. And so the plus side, I think, of intelligent design is that it is very good at kind of poking holes in our unjustified assumption about the veracity of the Darwinian theory. However, I think it's just bad theology. Um, they're not, obviously, they're not, they're, they're very, like Stephen Meyer especially, is very, very clear that he's not doing theology because he's not saying that oh, we don't know what the, he's not, he's not, he's not doing any theology because he's not saying um, this is God or this is the Christian God or, or, or something, but, but ID seems to be compatible with, and this is going to get really controversial really quick. It seems to be compatible with two things. One is Richard Dawkins' famous notion, and Dawkins isn't the only one that holds this, that, well, it could just be Aliens are a supercomputer that injected this intelligent life. Okay, so this is something like, you know, I want to say Elon Musk may, I think he's mentioned this, this a few times, like, oh, well, maybe we're living in a simulation. <clears throat> so intelligent design is compatible with that, that view, where it could have been aliens, it could have been some sort of superhuman intelligence, whatever that may mean, that kind of injected life, um, whereas this Thomistic critique is, is not for, for other reasons. And the second thing is that intelligent design does not get you to the God of classical theism. At the very best, it can get you to the God of neo-theism. This is where the controversy comes in because I'm using terms coined by Brian Davis at Fordham. <laughs> and so he makes a distinction between classical theism and neo-theism with classical theism referring to the God of um, Aquinas, Anselm, Augustine, Maimonides, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, theistic personalism. <coughs> and theistic personalism or neo-theism, I think neo-theism is, um, I don't know who used that. Somebody, somebody else does it, but, but they're synonymous. And um, so, so that would be, the, uh, that would be what, what intelligent design seems to, to get you toward, which would be like God being this, this individual being located within a genus and being basically a person without limits. And so this would be like the view held by Richard Swinburne, <coughs> where God is not the fundamental level of reality, but, but, but he, is, um, he, is, he is metaphysically composite and he is basically a person without limitation. And uh, I mean, I don't hold that view because I think I don't know. I, uh, I, I mean, I have reasons for not holding that, like the problem of composition where, okay, well, if God is a composite being, then how are those parts conjoined? And because um, it seems like a simple being would have to be ontologically prior to a composite being um, vis-a-vis Plotinus. And so, yeah, I, I think that I, in some, I think that intelligent design can't get you to the God of classical theism. And it in fact can get you into a lot of murky territory with regard to theology and stuff like the simulation hypothesis. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, that's good.
<coughs> I have a question, a quick, just a, a, a terminological question. What would be the difference between um, a latent active potentiality and an active potentiality, non-latent? This, this, this is interesting because I just came up with that on the fly. I'm looking at my scholastic bookshelf right now. Um, I'm not sure, because I've been just doing a lot of Plato this semester. I can't quite remember if anybody uses that exact terminology. Um, but I think what, what, I, what, what I meant to say is that, and, and so here's, let's see. So here's HG, H.D. Gardeel's book. This might be useful because he has a diagram of act and potency here. Um, <clears throat> it seems like, because I, what I was doing is I was using this in reference to Clark <coughs> and saying that he seems to say that there is like a potentiality, and this isn't his first theory, so keep in mind he rejects this. There seems to be this potentiality that is like almost unactualized until some certain point. And um, because, because so, so go back to what he was saying. He was, he was saying that in this first theory, the inorganic or the organic would have some like deep potentiality for rationality, which is not actualized until it meets certain conditions. So maybe you could, you could simplify this and just say, oh, it just has a potentiality, but, but it's not actualized until much farther along. Whereas it would seem that that would be a distinction between like, here we have a can and this can has the potentiality to be melted down um, or it has the potentiality to be crushed like that. And that potentiality is, is certainly more easily gotten to, I guess, um, than, than like a potentiality for the, for the organic to be rational. I don't know. I, that, that's just me like working off the top of my head, if that makes any sense. That's, that's what I came up with too. Not that the yeah. distinction was really crisp, but just the, that the latent active potentiality was farther, yeah. farther removed from the actualization of the potentiality than the non-latent. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, so the Gardeel here, he makes a lot of distinctions between act and potency. So he goes like objective, subjective potencies, um, passive, active, uncreated, created, rational, non-rational. So there are a ton of distinctions to be made, but I don't really see anything that has to do with what exactly we're talking about. Um, Phaser also makes distinctions between primary and secondary actualities and primary and secondary potentialities, which I don't fully understand yet, but yeah. <clears throat> okay, thanks. Can you say the, the name of that uh, for the scholar Gardiel is? Um, yeah, so so I have um, H G H D Gardiel G A R D. I'll type it in the chat. H G D I L. Um, um, and he has a he has a set. This is called the Intro to Philosophy of Saint Thomas, Volume Four. I also have a uh, Philosophy of Being. Phaser's metaphysics and a few other ones, but these are all references. They're all, all of my texts are found in the bibliography of Phaser's scholastic metaphysics. That's where I kind of get my sources. Any other questions? <laughs> uh, this might sound like a little bit of an odd uh, way to go about it, but I, I don't remember in this text the historic problem uh, against um, metaphysics for evolution, which would be um, uh, going back to uh, a, a knowledge problem. So the idea, just, just to give a easy one from like Plato or Aristotle. If I know a form, then it's eternal. If it's eternal and unchanging, things like that, then uh, that's the kind of thing that's gonna be stable the, with the kind of stability that we would need for us to have knowledge. 
uh, certainly for like a infallibleist kind of picture of knowledge. Uh, and so if evolution's right, then all the forms that refer to like animals uh, that are changing over time, like, well, those forms are not eternal and unchanging. So therefore we can't know things like genus and species or uh, things like that. Maybe we would know the relationship of uh, species to uh, a genus, but the, the category uh, that it corresponds to a species would be like not a stable category, the kind that would be the basis for knowledge. Um, and so obviously with Darwinian evolution, things like that, it cuts right at the, the vitals of that, that view. Um, so either you have to accept skepticism or you have to have like some other uh, criteria for knowledge that, that allows for something that's, that's not unchanging as far as like the forms and such. Um, but I don't think that uh, Clark brings this up, but like I believe Phaser tries to address that kind of stuff and um, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, unless, unless I'm just like, I've skipped a section as to what that was referring to. He brings that up because that's that's an argument that I I've I've heard briefly before, but I've 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 never studied. Is is that an Aristotle's Revenge? Ooh, I have not finished Aristotle's Revenge. I okay. think I got that for like <laughs> Christmas last year, and mm -hmm. I never I never finished it. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't think Clark brings that up at all. But I actually do. I've looked at the time. I have to run because the gym closes in at eleven, and there's a. UGA game tomorrow, which means it's not open. So I have to run over there real quick, but it was a pleasure and I will be here next week because this was a lot of fun. Great, Thank, thanks so much. Yeah, um, thank, uh, yeah, looking forward to uh, next week's uh, discussion as well. Uh, Greg, I think you're, you're presenting. Do you wanna tell us what you're gonna be talking about? Uh, why being is good. Perfect. I would, that, that's actually something because I was lecturing on abortion today and, and we got into antinatalism. So I'd need to be there for that. Good. Awesome. All right. I'll see you evil. all. <laughs> yes. The following week I'm doing evil, <laughs> yeah, right. so, uh, really more relevant for antinatalism. Awesome. All right. I will see you all next week. Right. Thank you very much. <laughs> all, right. all right. Take care. I was going to ask him, I find it interesting that a lot of his students were theists, but yet they still couldn't get out of this materialistic paradigm in regards to the mind and brain problem. And I'm just wondering where, where he would probably think the gap is. Like, why aren't people, well, at least at that stage of life, I suppose, not able to take that leap? Maybe if the mind, if the mind equals the brain, maybe God equals nature. So kind of a pantheistic yeah. God, right? Yeah, or nature, just sort of elevate nature as God. So you can use right. the God term and not have to refer to anything more complicated than nature. Right, yeah. I have a question. Can you guys hear me? Yep. yep. Cool. Uh, I'm wondering whether the two solutions he gives the one regarding latent active potentialities, and then the second one is to do with, um, what is it, a creation of the world as an ongoing process. I wonder whether they are too, um, too much set in juxtaposition or conflict with each other, which is a common tendency with Clark. He'll you know, try to, um, in order to, to present what he thinks is the best view, he'll you know, um, create a foil you know, what's, what's not the various foils, right? Um, I think, so I think his issue with the first solution is that it can tend to give a picture which seems to be deistic or quasi-deistic, you know, God just um, uh, is not as involved, you know, in, in creation um, as he wants it to be. Um, but 
yeah, I, I wonder whether this desire to um, have God, um, as he puts it, like constantly working creatively, uh, stepping up his critical collaboration at certain key thresholds to inject new information sets, um, whether that's unnecessarily interventionist. Um, so it falls into the, the trap of what most, you know, the intelligent design movement is critiqued for. Um, I don't know, what are, what are your guys' thoughts on that? Do, do you think he potentially falls into the trap of what Brian Davies calls theistic personalism? And viewing God as, uh, you know, intervening at key moments, particularly with the, you know, creation of the soul? Or not? I, I sort of agreed that that first the, the solution that he rejects would be a little bit too much uh, deistic. But the solution that he accepts, I didn't, uh, is it that God is intervening at key moments where those breaks occur? Or is it God is, is infusing the pieces and parts all the time to make them do what they, what it seems like they're doing, that he's never absent? Well, do they, do they, I, do they yeah, call I mean, that I, first I, one the god of the gaps? Is that what that that term refers to? The the god um, of the I gaps. I think that argument is used in the uh, intelligent design uh, critique yeah. that that you know, like um, you know, sort of the, the 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 punctuated equilibrium that we've gotten in evolution that Stephen uh, Gould talked about, like that 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 could not have happened. Uh, in a material sense that God actually had to intervene to get these dynamic shifts from one particular organism to another that's much more evolved. Hmm. But I, but getting back to your question, uh, Samuel, I think uh, even, even if you look at God's intervention in, in a not, uh, in a physical sense of, of in, in creation, but just in that immeasurable sense through grace uh, in our way, like grace is, grace is everywhere, but we can at moments tap into that. Isn't that enough to acknowledge God's ever-present, imminent um, relationship to us in a sense? Is that clear in the way I'm describing it? Yeah, yeah, I know. I, 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 I think that's fine. I, I just, and to be fair, he does like qualify slightly. He says something like, um, "Such creative intervention, or perhaps better creative collaboration of God." I think this, the, he, he prefers this notion of like a collaborate a creative collaboration between you know go, um between god and humans like a dance you know use that metaphor to dance in the previous chapters you know um which is fine um but i i, I guess my yeah i don't know that's just my personal sensibilities um that it seems to at least, yeah, it seems to indulge in like what I can call like an objectification of God as a finite agent or finite, finite being, right? Who in, um, initiates uh, or injects new information at certain moments, right? Which is, I think it's, I mean, Clark would probably agree that this is not a real change in God, you know, this is, just we we perceive it as this is new um, information which we learn about. Why right? it's not like um, God's life becomes richer over time after He creates humans or whatever. You know. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess that's just my worry. If that makes sense.
Did any of you, um, just a related question, did any of you guys get, uh, perhaps look at some of those chapters he referenced? So there was one book, I think I must have read it a while ago. There's the, you know, those three views books, there's three views in creative creation and evolution. And I think he cited two of the chapters. One was on progressive evolution, which I think is more closer to Clark's view. And then the other was on, uh, by this guy called, uh, what's his name? So I can find the title. I, I remember his last name was Van Til, but it wasn't Cornelius Van Til. <laughs> um, it was, let's see. H. Van Howard. Van Howard. Okay. Howard. Mm. Howard. Yeah, and it's T A L L. Um, you could no, do better I, than I, I was Cornelius just Van Til, that's for sure. <laughs> Certainly, yeah. Um, I was just skimming some of the ch this chapter um, by Howard Van Til in his collection just, just before, and um, and also just looking at some of the responses as well. Uh, he gets in the first chapter. I, I like the the language he uses. He uses he he so he says um, the. the he, instead of theistic evolution, he first this phrase that he came up with, which is called the fully gifted creation, um, which is supposed to, um, you know, uh, emphasize that creation is already kind of like the first solution, which Clark is close to the first solution, you know, Clark, there's a kind of like, you know, a latent act of potentiality in creation. Um, there's no need for God to further gift or inject new information, you know, because it's already fully gifted or um, at all times, you know, um, right from the beginning, right to the, you know, to the end, there's an end. Um, and one of the common criticisms, or at least one of the criticisms I heard, or I read rather of, this guy's position is one that you just I, we just mentioned earlier about how it seems to be um like deistic over emphasizing god's imminence to the extent, not so much emphasizing god's transcendence you know uh his his ability to uh intervene causing discontinuity as much as continuity right Whereas this guy Van Til, he wants to emphasize, you know, the, the 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 continuities that you can see just from a natural, a uh, methodologically naturalist perspective, right? And um, yeah, I think that's I think that criticism is valid in in some sense, but but I would just rectify Van Til's position slightly and and just try to um say that we we can emphasize we can emphasize as much the discontinuities as much as the continuities you know throughout the natural history of evolution while not adopting um a special creationist perspective where god's intervening you don't need to go to that step in order to avoid the um um uh, in, in order to avoid this uh, overly eminentist or pantheistic which, by the way, is usually just a, a word people throw around um, <laughs> when um, pantheist, when, when, when you know someone's model of God seems too uh, imminent. Um, which I think, yeah, I think this just shows you how some people want God to be like a transcendent entity who you know has the who is um, you know uh, whose aseity enables him to do whatever you know, and that's. To preserve God's freedom, essentially, or at least what people think is God's freedom, you know, to do things right. But yeah, I, I still think that's just a, a misguided um, worry because, um, as I think I said at some previous sessions, if any of you recall, I, I, I think that you can emphasize God's the gratuity of creation you know that it's not that um it's ultimately a gift and unnecessary in a sense while also emphasizing um creation's necessity in some sense 
if, if not this particular creation, that but some creation. You know, you can, you can say that it's necessary conditionally that if God, God to be God, must create. You know, and, and that's not, um, um, you know, and 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 I would even probably go so far as to say God must create via some means of evolution. I think that's in some sense, uh, maybe not the exact evolution that we see, you know, the exact history. Uh, there must be some, I want to say, you know, there's some contingency in, you know, God's act of creation, you know. But I think that um, in some ways it makes far more sense if God, if the God of classical theism is, that picture is true, that you, you, you don't have um, any kind of special creationism. You know, you have rather some uh, uh, picture of evolution, which on one level looks random and unguided, but on another level, a deeper level, can be seen as guided and um, opposive, right? I think you need to, that's the whole point of this, as I see it, the secondary versus, uh, secondary causality, Thomistic distinction is, you know, um, is to see that there's two levels of looking at reality, you know, um, and they can be seen as in con or as contra not to say contradictory, but like they can seem like they are in conflict if you're looking, you know, from one level. But ultimately, if you know, if um, God is to be God, you know, then God will, as you know, Christian hope proclaims. Uh, will be all in all, ultimately. One great thing, especially twenty-eight, right? I think that's yeah. Is anyone here familiar with Wolfgang Smith's arguments? Um, he specifically rejects theistic evolution. You know the Teilhard de Chardin and this idea that, that that evolution is a thing at all, um, but I'm not real familiar with it. Um, I know he's got a whole book on it. Yeah, I have the book, and I, I'd like to familiarize myself with it. Um, but I guess I, I just intuitively I persuaded by a perspective more like um oh damn i've forgotten the guy's name brian you've you've quoted him several times uh the radical orthodoxy guy who wrote the book on oh, Darwin. Uh, connor cunningham yeah what's the book he wrote I've forgotten. uh oh gosh what's what's it called um uh it's something called like Darwin's pious theory. Pious or, idea. Uh, pious idea. Darwin's, yeah, yeah. Pi Darwin's pious idea. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Subtitled uh, "Why the uh, the Ultra Darwinists and the uh, Creationists Both Get It Wrong." Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that's that's uh, that's extremely. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, he 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 gives a very good good treatment of of all the issues and and debates and kind of the way that that sometimes they're it's it's framed in ways that are not as edifying as as they could be um who is who is the other fellow that i was uh uh oh um and you like a might also, book yeah you might also be interested in a fellow called uh wine and de beer uh yeah yeah that one and yeah. he's written a book called From Logos to Bios, uh, Evolutionary Theory in Light of Plato, Aristotle, and uh, Neoplatonism. And, you know, he, he writes, um, he is an Orthodox Christian, and uh, he definitely writes, you know, from a similar kind of traditionalist perspective as Wolfgang Smith. Uh, but he's inclined to see, you know, a kind of um, evolution, right, that, of course, I mean, the, the core thing that Wolfgang Smith is concerned about and that he doesn't think will hold up under evolution, right, is sort of the distinction between horizontal and vertical causality 
or you know as many many scholastic metaphysicians right they want to preserve you know all the four aristotelian causes right and you know they want to figure out how that meshes with evolutionary theory or with things like uh, uh, phys physics you know both newtonian and quantum but uh, in, in this case, um, Wine and De Beer kind of puts forward, um, um, he, he, he draws on uh, theorists like I think, uh, I think it's Thomas Darcy and, you know, a number of others who basically, you know, you want to see uh, kind of um, a mathematical brilliance and guiding intelligence in uh, evolution such that, you know, it's not it's not a blind uh, process, but but one that kind of um, you know you can see as reflective of something like uh, you know the Platonic ideas or archetypes or sort of an, an unfolding of innate potential, right? Uh, so um, yeah, I haven't I don't have a settled uh, view on the issue, but I mean I think these are both very interesting. Uh, inquiries. The word uh, panentheism kind of has grown on me because that's kind of the notion of God being both eminent and transcendent. And I think that, you know, that to me sort of paints more of a fuller picture. But it's interesting when you read somebody like, uh, I'm not really greatly fond of his work because I think I'm not really into process theology that much these days. But Charles Hartshorn, he, 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 he actually talked about almost like two gods, right? He, he talked about a transcendent God and an eminent God. And because the eminent God was, was evolving and the transcendent God was perfectly full and perfect in, it, in himself, he couldn't necessarily reconcile the two. So he kind of kept both sort of compartmentalized on some level, which is interesting, right? So not only do we have a dualistic world, but we have a dualistic God. <laughs> and, um, but I think he was just his way of conveying that he felt that, you know, God, God was ex expressing himself in, in, in both, in both ways, like as, as full in his perfection, that there was nothing that needed to be added or taken away, but yet his creation was going somewhere divine and 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 that was his intent and impulse so it you know i'm i'm probably butchering some of this but but that's sort of how i recall his work kind of uh parsing it out you know and it makes me think of too as well i i've been reading a little bit about how this issue has come up from time to time in um the um hebrew and later jewish tradition and uh I believe it there was a Talmudic debate where they were, you know, scouring uh, you know, scripture saying, well, you know, is is the universe in God or is God in the universe? Right. And I think they found uh a verse possibly in Exodus, uh, where it's it's like, you know, the world is not a place for God, but but God is a place for the world. And on the basis of, I don't remember what the text was, that was what they uh, concluded, but but there's one line in Exodus which suggests that rather it's 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 that uh, the world manifests itself uh, from Him. Uh, but it, it was it was just like one one brief verse that kind of like ah there it is, you know, because otherwise it's it's a little bit mysterious, right? I mean there are a lot of you know, um, but um, obviously that so that that's a very prominent stream within uh you know the mystical tradition of uh the old 
Old Testament as well as the New Testament, for sure. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, the divine omnipresence, right? I mean, I mean at what point does that, you know, um, I mean, of course, people, philosophers want to avoid this idea that, uh, you know, except, except, except obviously in, in like a special case like the incarnation, but they want to avoid some idea that the universe is God's body, I suppose, or that he's corporally present. So they'll often stress, I think, that, that it's his knowledge, it's in respect of his knowledge that he's everywhere, right? Like kind of his vision uh, pierces all things, right? And he kind of envelops all things in his wisdom. Um, but, but uh, on the other hand, right? I mean, it, it, we shouldn't assume like, like vision, I, I, again, I, I just harp on about this sometimes, but like, like vision, if you look at the theory, pre-modern theories of vision, it was almost a tactile sense right? Because they thought you, your, your eyes would shoot out beams of light that would have a real union with the, the things they knew, right? Which makes me think also of the way that, I mean, uh, you know, Rabbi Maimonides, right, thought in terms of uh, uh, just ordinary um, cognition, right, was a union of subject, object, and, um, and knowledge, right? I mean, he, that, that epistemic triad that you also see in uh, you know, things like, um, you know, uh, Hindu philosophy, right, in, in uh, Vedanta or, or other schools. Um, and, and, and so, uh, I, don't know, I mean, I'm sure a lot of the history of kind of making pantheism and, you know, a, a boogeyman has to do with, um, you know, Spinoza and, you know, some of the things that were happening in, in uh, early modern philosophy. And, I'm looking for, I, that's something I'd like to study in a little more detail. Um, but my overall impression is that, I mean, first of all, we misconstrue what pantheism is, right? And then we have to bring in panentheism to kind of um, correct it and, and sort of, night, Jonathan, glad you could uh, join us. Um, I mean, you know, I, I guess, what 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 is the um what is the pantheism that uh like other than spinoza the other figure that i think of is or the other tradition i think of as representative of pantheism is like um i guess the stoics right or something along those lines right uh it's sort of like um uh, you know equating equating god with with the cosmos and sort of you know that that that's sort of like um, it's it's like it is his body, like right, like um, but but there's a way to construe that that doesn't, I think, dissolve God, uh, you know, into the cosmos. Um, but it really, I mean, the devil's in the details, right? So, um, what, Samuel, would what, what are you just sharing there? So you're saying that you think. Uh, no, it's a pantheist, yeah. not a pantheist. Say that Apparently. one more time. It seems more plausible that Noza was a panentheist rather than a pantheist. So pantheism, pantheism may result largely from an uncharitable reading of certain... Yeah, yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like supposing... Yeah, I mean, I, I don't... I haven't read a lot of... Spinoza, he's certainly on my list, but I mean, my, my sense is that he was quite a brilliant uh, philosopher and, and he, you know, I, I wouldn't think that he would have kind of a deficient, I mean, it, it could still be deficient, but it wouldn't be a conception of God that is not cognizant of some of those distinctions that, that you know, um, a caricatured form of pantheism would, uh, right? Right, yeah. My understanding is that while he spent a lot of the scholastic vocabulary and con concepts, you know, um, he still retained another form, so like interacting with the new experimental science of the 17th century, right? He retained notions of um, more final causality, but in different language. So not in the, in the exact same Aristotelian language, but just in, in, in more 
um, yeah, in more mechanistic language, which people might not like as much. Um, but the point is the mechanistic, and this is not, um, and just to make a broader point, you know, a lot of um, Christian theists from the 17th and 18th century onwards, scientists, you know, um, they appealed to mechanistic metaphors for explicitly Christian theological purposes. So it was never, and, and this is actually the origin for a lot of naturalism, you know, the first methodological, because they were the originators of what often called methodological naturalism. Um, you know, Christians and, um, and Jews, in a sense, Spinoza, we include them as well, right? Um, but yeah, so, yeah, so you can critique the language or the metaphor if you want, but the point is you need to recognize at the same time that um, it's a reflection of the culture of the time. So you can't blame the person just for using the, the dominant meta, you know, image of the day, right? Um, yeah, so that's, I think, hopefully that's helpful, yeah. I, I just don't know how else to make sense of much of the traditional devotional language, right? Of that every, I mean, every monotheistic tradition wants to say that, you know, God is in us in some sense, or he's, he's near, he's so near to us that, that you know, nearer than, than anything could be near to us. Right. I mean, he's, he's, I mean, he's in our heart and, and I, you know, I don't think we can just, we don't have to just immediately reduce that to it. Oh, it's, it's a kind of metaphor. It's sort of, you know, uh, he's not really in us. <laughs> there's not, you know, there's not really that kind of, um, you know, I mean, the, the, well, the language of is, what, <laughs> what connotation you give the word metaphor. You don't have to, I mean, like, it means etymologically a transfer, meta, ferin in Greek, right? And so, same with symbol, you know, a symbol, you don't have to give it like a negative, you know, it's just, it's just a symbol. <laughs> you, people add the phrase just a symbol or just a metaphor um, in order to give it this anti-realist kind of spin, which you don't have to give it necessarily. Well, that's what I'm just kind of, you know, because. I guess that's sort of the distinction I'd been used to is between a metaphor and a symbol, but I need some word to say kind of, you know, kind of too weak and wispy, you know, like, like where we're basically negating it by saying it, it's just kind of a poetic conceit. Uh, not that, and I mean, obviously as somebody who thinks that I love poetry and I, I love, um, and I think poesis is really kind of deeper than that, but, but just, you know, where people want to say, you know, cause, cause the, the assumption and the really we're, we're really it really it's naturalism but we're kind of we've got this air you know yeah. airy uh imaginary sense in which god is is within us because we because it we, we just talking about our feelings about god or something or you know or or like our wishful you know aspirationally he's like he's in us as our enthusiasm, or you know what I mean. Like it can it can be yeah. a way of limiting uh, yeah, the I radicality of, of yeah. You know, what's... The, yeah, that's the problem with people like Don Cupid or these so-called Christian fictionalists or Christian atheists. You know, that they presume the um, naturalistic or materialistic paradigm is triumphant. You know, has defeated the superstitions of the past. Um, and therefore, we, if we want to be religious or Christian in any sense, we need to only use the symbology or the, the mythology as um, useful to us existentially and emotionally. You know, there's an emphasis on the, um, and yeah, and I think that emphasis can turn into a, an anti, uh, an, into a, um, a, a fideism, a kind of. Yeah, um, <laughs> um, a, a which um, 
diminishes the role of noose or intellect in the spiritual and theological life. And I think that certainly needs to be critiqued as much as the, um, those, those uh, quote unquote supernaturalists who these fictionalists are opposing, you know, they also need to be critiqued because they presume a kind of dualistic image of, you know, God and creation. Um, yeah. I do think there's a mystical way of approaching that too. You know, like when Augustine says, God is closer to me than I am to myself. I think he was talking about it, not necessarily metaphorically or poetically, but I think he he had some kind of mystical realization, you know, that he sort of felt that backed it up. You know, and it gets back to like the Orthodox when they talk about God's essence and his energies. You can't really know God's essence, but his energies you can. And I think that that's where the relationship and the mystical communion can actually take place. So I think that that's where, that's one one way we could look at it, you know? And I, and I think that's the beauty of this is that there, there are many doorways to understanding God. You know, you, you could take the intellectual approach. And I think based on different dispositions and temperaments of people, people are gonna be, they're gonna gravitate towards certain ways of relating to God. You know, some people might take the more reason-based approach through the you know intellectual inquiry others are going to be a little more metaphorical or poetic others are going to be more mystical and i think that you know i'd like to think that you know the divine kind of created that as such that you know they you know that he could be known in in many ways and 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 based on his creation that's maybe a little little bit idealistic but that's the way i like to look at it I really like this idea that, you know, the creation of the world is an ongoing process. <clears throat> I remember when I first heard the, the argument of the unmoved mover in high school, um, I just assumed that it was like, okay, so there's this unmoved mover that creates all of time, space and material existence. And then everything's just kind of unfolding after that, uh, according to the laws of physics and, you know, determinism but I've, I've since realized that this that that's not I don't think what what the idea is or right? you've got this this unmoved mover um, that that is sort of in this the a realm beyond time and space um, this eternal being that that's like the ground of being for material existence uh, so, um, while we're experiencing time and movement and, and all of these other things, it's not experienced that way from the perspective of eternity. Um, it's, it's all part of the, the act of creation that happened instant, is happening instantaneously from the divine perspective. Um, I don't know, I feel like I'm rambling now. But anyway, I like that idea that that it's uh, it's an ongoing process. Uh, Ted, I, I like your um I like your uh, point about there being many ways to God and it reminds me of um in uh, the Advaita Vedanta classes they teach that you know, there's karma yoga, bhakti yoga, raja yoga, jnana yoga, and all of them are um, valid, and they depend on a person's affinities. And, you know, the, the, it's funny, the school that I learned that from is Vedanta, and then so they, they tend to put jnana yoga on top, you know, almost everybody puts one of the others on top, but all can get you there. And it's a very... Um, other than that little bit of um, hierarchical privileging, I think that it's a very uh, generous scheme. Yeah, uh, thanks for reminding me of that. I, I, I was aware of that, and I think that is a good way of uh, compartmentalizing, I guess, the way they, they view all these different 
pass to God. Um, but yeah, I think there's always going to be uh, a privileging of one over the other, depending on the approach you're taking or the tra tradition you're in. Um, but um, it's, it's a soft it's a soft pri privileging. It's, it's sure, you know, it's, yeah. it's a little bit part of the, you know, if I look at it from the Advaita Vedanta perspective, it's a little bit, it belongs to the advertising department of their teaching, not the serious metaphysical part. So they're teaching Yana yoga and that's what they like to, to um, put emphasis on. But um, they I also are... think there needs to be maybe an integration. I mean, you know, obviously you're going to, be partial maybe to one over the other but i could see how um you know for instance they, they like, say you've got to do all of them to some extent yeah yeah because i think you can you know like i i know a lot of people that are very experiential focused you know when it comes to their relationship to spirit mm -hmm. um but they get into very um very incoherent bad theological views on things you know they don't necessarily really um they, they they tend to simplify it in certain ways but their but their overall view is not very coherent because they they haven't necessarily done the intellectual study to really understand all the different ways that you can approach theology and metaphysics and philosophy around the idea of a god or or, or divine spirit so I think you do need uh, some mix of all these different modalities to really get a pretty good understanding of, of the nature of reality. I agree. Uh, what I don't know so much about is in the, uh, say in the Christian tradition, if, if there's any teaching that, that recommends what you just said, you know, balance, is there any sort of uh, schema that, is similar to that Vedantic schema that you can think of? This is, there are different ways we should probably, you know, use them as checks and balances on each other, but we might all uh, gravitate towards one because we have such affinities. Is there anything like that? Yeah. Well, in in, medieval, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, in medieval, okay, you, you know, there's that distinction between the, the Vita contemplative and the um, contemplative life and the practical life. But um, as I was saying on a group just yesterday, we were doing a Plotinus, we got a Plotinus reading group on uh, Ennead 3.8 on the one um, in contemplation. Um, the, um, the distinction between the contemplative life and the active life was um had a different basis before Aquinas so you know when Aquinas says you know in the Summa that the uh, contemplative life is superior to the active life you know he that was linked that statement was linked to you know him as a Dominican in a kind of um cloister like environment you know um and saying that that I mean obviously because he was Dominican he wasn't as he, he, they did preaching and teaching that's the combined role you know so they were a bit active but primarily you know kind of contemplative right um as um part of the the orders of the day right um the and just note orders. right there it was a yeah. very common thing right and even today yeah. right i mean you think of the yeah. catholic uh, orders you know there are orders yeah. that are like the carmelites for instance are a contemplative yeah. order first and foremost yeah. almost pure you know or the carthusians i suppose uh and then there are really act orders that are more about service right mm -hmm. and and there are orders That's that are act particularly yeah yes yeah. And, and there are yeah. orders that, that are active um in other ways like as you say preaching and teaching right the charism of the yeah. dominicans that which would be i guess a mixed life and if i remember correctly mm -hmm. aquinas recommends the mixed life as as generally you know the way to he go does. right he does, but there's still this um, this clear yeah, difference for the, the contemplative uh, that is prior and superior, you know, to the to the active life. Um, whereas, and that's fundamentally an Aristotelian um, argument. You, it's, it's not so much in Aristotle, but Aristotelians after Aristotle, they are 
made this really sharp distinction as socio-political distinction you know between um the elite scholars who live the contemplative life you know and um artisans you know that live the practical life or all the you know um menial labor and that sort of thing right um but in someone a bit earlier in christianity like gregory the great um you see this earlier see this um other sense of what the contemplative uh um versus the act of life means which is in the alexandrian tradition um you know um people like uh, you know from philo to clement to origin etc cetera, et cetera, you know um where it's about the it's not about two separate ways of living but some but rather it's um stages of growth in the spiritual path and which everyone can attain so so in, in this schema which i i find preferable because i think it's less apt to um elitist abuse right you have for everyone you have um uh, the 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 active life is kind of like the first stage of catharsis or purification that you find in the eastern orthodox church right um where you mainly do uh, uh the cardinal virtues of um you know the four cardinal virtues um of justice temperance uh whatever the other two are i forgot <laughs> Uh, Cur courage and courage. Uh, wisdom and prudence. So yeah, so for yeah, yeah, that's right. Or sorry, um, phronesis, yeah, and great. Um, uh, and and then the second stage, theodia or illumination, you know, the the the, um, the path is kind of like the contemplative life, right? So and where you you go from the cardinal virtues, which you know everyone, to the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity, right? Um, and I think this is one Christian way to appropriate the uh, pagan heritage and its virtues, particularly the Aristotelian schema, right? While going beyond it, so using it as like a handmaiden to use the uh, the medieval language, right? Handmaiden uh, philosophy, handmaiden to theology. Or Christian theology. And so here everyone is progressing to the contemplative life, even if they're not like intellectually minded people, you know. Um, we are insofar as anyone, you know, progresses in faith, hope, and charity, they are becoming more contemplative in the sense that they are becoming more mindful to use like Buddhist language, you know, mindfulness in a sense, right? Um, because a, a lot of these cardinal virtues are kind of ways to uh, what's the word? control the the passions in a sense right um it's it's kind of they're kind of all summed up in, in one with the self-control and kratia to be in control right self-control um which is yeah kind of like the practical like the the, the a basic virtue which people in you know in daily life need to sort of acquire self-mastery right yeah that's right um and yeah, you don't have to give this this language of self mastery a kind of elitist connotation, although that often was unfortunately the, the, the connotation because you have um, the this this lang uh, 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 the metaphor of the slave was often used. You know, um, to be in control means to subdue your slavery to your to your passions, right? And then you know, 
um, yeah, that can evolve um, or devolve, devolve rather into um, a preservation of the uh, hierarchical status quo. But it doesn't have to, you, you know, the, the metaphor itself, self-mastery is not corrupt um, intrinsically. So. Well, I think that's why uh, humility is is the ultimate virtue, and and I, I kind of see cultivating virtue as a way of purifying oneself to become a vessel for the expression of of God's I don't know grace or whatever in the world. I mean, maybe the world itself is a is a vessel for for God's expression, and the human is is where it achieves its its peak um, or peak potential of manifestation in the world um, but we have to be a well we have to get ourselves out of the way which means emptying the vessel um, but there's also these other ways to to purify ourselves you know through the the different the different virtues um, I've, I've kind of gotten this, I, this sense with some people, you know, a lot of people that are really focused on metaphysics that, yeah, you know, virtue, but once you, once you get it, once you, once you really get it, virtue is not necessary or it'll, it'll come. I mean, and I get that, that there's a sense that, you know, if you, you, you have a direct, I don't know, understanding of, of the reality of being or God or whatever that a lot of virtue will will naturally follow but I think it's also works that by cultivating virtue one elevates oneself to uh, uh, be more likely to have that experience of reality Greg, you're on mute if you're trying to say something. He's got, uh, that's in Plotinus too. It's, uh, he's got the, and the virtues are absolutely necessary, even though his, his path uh, could be looked at as, as highly uh, contemplative. He's got the, the, the sort of the social or the political or the cardinal virtues. And then he's got the purifying virtues. And those have to do more with... <clears throat> coming to see better and better that we and humility is a part of it it's coming to see better and better that our true home or our true nature is not the body and as you see that better and better and better that prepares you to have deeper and deeper ways of seeing into you know the intelligible and then ultimately to the one uh, post you know post conceptually and the thing about uh, what you, uh, Matthew, about um, about people who take the maybe the more theoretical or philosophical route, thinking that virtue is not necessary, that's a big, big deal in the Eastern traditions, especially the ones, especially those breakaway traditions that have found their way to the West, where people practice, per, but perhaps don't adopt all of Buddhism or all of Hinduism. Um, there are these, you know, it happens all over social media and the, the forums about, you know, the people, the Yana Yogans criticizing the, the, bhakti, the Bhaktas and the Bhaktas criticizing the Yanas. It happens a lot. Whereas the traditional paths themselves have a much, much more balanced <clears throat> uh, recommendation that we should all do all of them and that means practice the virtues i remember one time i had a, a vedanta class and the instructor who was a big advocate of this full sort of the robust full uh path recommended that the that the students all take up a personal deity and some of the americans in the class almost stopped going because they didn't want to do that they couldn't imagine themselves as becoming devoted to a deity figure at all. And everything that that would, you know, that would mean worship, that would mean, 
you know, obeisances of different sorts. It would be trying to cultivate the virtues that that deity represents. They did not want any part of that, yet they wanted knowledge. So Talk yes, it's a big, it could be a way. big deal. Hmm? Talk about being in your own way, right? Well, I, I think it's, an, it's really fascinating because the way I would have maybe took an angle on that is that you know we we are what we love right so we 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 end up becoming whatever we whatever we see as an object of affection and so if you're not taking a deity of something divine based on tradition you're taking some other deity there's ta there's something in the secular temporal world that you're probably focused on that's become your deity but you don't look at it that way well, yeah, yeah, sure. Or, 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 or it could be, you know, celebrities, let's say, you know, could be, um, could be um, some kind of hobby of some sort. But I think, I think that's an interesting practice, you know. Um, yeah, I, 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 uh, I really like uh, Alice, Alistar, Alistar McIntyre, is that the way you pronounce it? His uh, book, After Virtue. He, he, he really gets into this whole notion of, um, you know, we really have to inhabit the practices, you know, like that's the only way we're really going to take virtue on is that it has to come through a habit of practice, ideally in a community if possible, but, but that's ultimately what we all strive for. This, oh, I'm just going to find this job there. <laughs> Did you want to end the recording, maybe? I guess we've kind of slightly gone off tangent. So, I mean, yeah, I think, I think, uh, yeah, so um, it's been a great uh, discussion. Um, and uh, we've ranged uh, far and wide. Um, which uh, I think is one of the great things about these uh, sessions is that we're able to uh, focus on the given topic and then kind of bring in whatever, whatever has sort of been on our minds or that we want to, to share with each other. So um, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for joining us this time. And, uh, you know, feel free to stick around if, if you want to uh, after and the recording. And uh, if you're watching this uh, recording from home, uh, thanks for joining us. And we hope that you can uh, uh, join us live sometime in the future. So uh, take care.